Walt, I'd like to know whether God exists, and I've been talking to philosophers of religion, theologians, and people who contradict them, like yourself. And oftentimes, they give their arguments, and then we hear the counter-arguments. What I'd like to do is flip it around and give a real tough-minded atheist, got any examples, who can <laughs> help me to understand what the strong arguments for atheism, the affirmative arguments for atheism, then we'll see what the theists can do with it. Good, fair enough. <laughs> you ought to be able to give arguments for your views. And I've got three of them. Uh, the first two will depend on conflicts between different attributes of God. The first one is the problem of evil, and it depends on the conflict between God being all good and all powerful. Okay. The second argument is the argument from, or the problem of action, I call it, and that's the conflict between God being eternal or outside of time or changeless, even if he's within time, and yet causes things to happen in time by answering prayers and performing miracles. I don't think you can have it both ways. So in this argument, you're really looking for an internal inconsistency, and that if there is this inconsistency, and th the whole thing falls apart, you don't have to go any further than that if you have an internal inconsistency. Right. You might have to add one uncontroversial premise, like there's suffering in the world and so sure. on. But otherwise, it's an internal inconsistency, okay. exactly. The third argument is different because it's not looking for an internal inconsistency among attributes of God, uh, which would only target a certain type of God, but rather it's, called, it's the argument from ignorance. As I see it, there's very little reason to believe in gods, even types of gods that don't have those attributes I talked about earlier. And yet, if God existed, you would have better reason to believe in God. So since you don't have better reason, you shouldn't believe in, uh, in any type of God. Okay. A much more general form of argument. Fine. Now I see the okay. landscape. I see these three arguments. I'm ready for them. Uh, so give me, start with your best shot, which I think I know what it's going to be. Well, it's the problem of evil. <laughs> and my best shot for the problem of evil is birth defects. You know, people often talk about evil in the world in terms of wars and famines. Well, those are created by political problems often. And then you can escape the argument by citing free will and how God allowed these political rulers to create the famine and so on. But the birth defects are different. They're natural evil. They don't occur because of humans using their free will. So let's look at a particular birth defect, Down syndrome. Children with Down syndrome very often encounter intestinal blockages early in their lives, right after birth. These often have to receive operations just to stay alive. But they didn't know how to do this operation until the 20th century. So think about all the people who were born with Down syndrome in the 19th century, the 18th century, the 17th century, and so on. All of those little kids were born with intestinal blockages, suffered tremendous pain as they died horrific deaths. And what did God have to do to stop that? All God had to do was go in and change their genes in a way that they wouldn't have this disease, and their intestines would not be blocked. Well, he could easily have done that if he's all-powerful. And if he didn't do that, how can we say that he's all-good? I don't see how an all-good God could allow that kind of thing to happen on that scale. Maybe you'd allow it to happen a few times here and there to create sympathy or to contrast with the good life. There are all kinds of stories that theologians tell about why God would allow this. But in the end, if humans were to allow their kids to die from this kind of intestinal blockage when they could stop it, you'd think those humans were monsters. And for God to allow this time after time through century after century suggests to me that he's at the very least not all good. Well, I think the argument against that is that you are positing a God in, in your image and that the real God that some people would say is there um, really has uh, desires and uh, uh, goals and purposes that are so far beyond your conception that you can't even begin in principle to, to know it. Right. Maybe he likes children to suffer. That would be beyond my ability to understand. Sure, and that if he has those kinds of desires, 
for those evil events to occur. I don't see why we call them all good. Well, I think what you would be doing is confirming the fact that you are really unable to imagine God by using that example, because that would not be the, the intent of that. There'd be something that would have to do with God's purpose for the whole world, and as it's, it's, it's systematized, uh, uh, random probabilities are developing, and some ultimate goal, that these are some of the byproducts, and God in his own way are going to solve this. Maybe these kids will go to heaven. I don't know what it is, but the point is it's far beyond your and my conception. But that's well, the argument. You may not like it, but it's, it's, I think, the best. Well, the problem is I don't know what it is either. And they don't know what it is either. The theists don't know what it is either. Yeah, that's right. So they can say, maybe there's something. But in the end, you look at the poor children who were suffering, and you ask, if God had stopped that Down syndrome child from dying that horrific death, what, would that have stopped World War II? Would that have you know, prevented the deterioration of an ecosystem? I mean, maybe, but I see no reason to believe anything of the sort. And as a result, I see no reason to believe in any God of that sort. Let's go to the second argument, the argument uh, regarding action right. in the world, this God's one, action in the world. This one's much less common. The problem of evil is an old one that yeah. lots of people talk about. But the problem of action, I think, is just as serious. The problem here is that God is supposed to be either eternal or omnipresent and unchanging. But let's stick to eternal first. Eternal, as I'm using the term, because it's used in different ways, but as I'm using the term, means exists outside of time. So what's another thing that exists outside of time? Well, the number five exists outside of time. Uh, it's not like five existed in the 19th century, but not in the 20th century, it wouldn't even make sense to talk about such things, or that the number five exists in Australia, but not North America. Five exists outside of time and space, the number five. And as a result, five doesn't have effects within time and space. Maybe the fact that I have five children makes me very busy, but it's not the number five that does that, it's the five kids that makes me busy. The number five by itself doesn't have any effects and can't, in principle, have any effects because it exists outside of time and space. Now, why would that be? To have an effect inside of time and space, you have to change at just the right time. So if a baseball batter swings too high or too low or too early or too late, misses the ball. You've got to swing at just the right time and just the right place in order to hit the ball. For one event, you know, to cause something to happen, you have to change at just the right time and place. So something that exists outside of time and space can't cause anything to happen. So if God exists outside of time and space, God can't answer your prayers, cannot cause miracles to happen, and all the things that are said about God in the traditional religions. The arguments against that really bifurcate into two major areas. There is a group of philosophers and theologians, which is actually increasing, that believe that the traditional explanation that, that, that existed maybe for a thousand years in Christianity is erroneous. That God is indeed in time, that the biblical God is in time, that it was only the marriage of Greek philosophy and early Christianity that, that created this timeless God. So that's, that's one set of arguments which, right. which undercut that, that argument uh, against God completely yeah. because if God's in time, well, then that argument disappears. I don't think it really fully undercuts it. A lot of people say that, but it seems to me that if God exists in time, but is, as many of these theologian, theologians still say, existent at all times equally, wholly and fully and equally existent at all times, and therefore still unchanging even though he exists in time, you still can't... Exist. We are now descending just, into very arcane theology because yes. then it's the question of what do you mean by change? Is it an external change? Of If I'm my height and you started out shorter and you grow bigger than me, then I'm suddenly shorter than you when I used to be taller, but I haven't changed. And it's very complicated arguments. But let me give you the other, the okay. other strand. The okay. other strand says, yes, God is outside of time, but because God can see all of time and every event in this sort of four-dimensional universe, and people can quote Einstein on that, and they're very similar, that God sort of knew what was going to happen and sees the whole thing, so you know, God can see every event even though God is not, not changed. I mean, there are arguments that get very complicated, but I do agree that it, it is an, a legitimate argument 
uh, against God to, to, to pose this contradiction. Uh, that can't explain it either, though. If God is simply outside of time looking in, it's like watching a movie. I can't change what happens in the movie when I watch it. You can only change what happens in the movie if you're in the movie. I think it's a, that's a harder argument to make. I <laughs> okay. definitely agree with that. Let's take the third. Okay. The, the arguments for, the, the argument from, uh, from uh, that God is hidden. Right. This is what I call the argument from ignorance. Uh, argument of God is hidden would be the way a theist would put it. But <laughs> argument from ignorance is the way an atheist puts it. And it's a more general argument because it doesn't depend on those particular attributes that I mentioned earlier. The argument here is basically that there's no good reason to believe in God. Now that's going to take a lot to show. We've got to argue against the traditional proofs for the existence of God and so on. But if I can establish that premise, and that would take a long time to establish, then the argument is if God did exist, there would be better reason to believe that he exists. Okay, And that's crucial. Because, for example, if I say uh, there's no cockroach in this room because when I look around, I don't see one, that would be a horrible argument because I wouldn't see it even if it was there. But if I say there's no elephant on this table, then that's a, and there, uh, how do I know that? Because I don't see one, then uh, that's a good argument. Yeah. Assuming it's a normal elephant, right. not an invisible right. elephant or a tiny right. elephant right. or a tiny elephant. If it's a normal elephant, I would see it if it were here. And therefore, the fact that I don't have good reason to think there's an elephant on this table is good reason to think there's no elephant on this table. And I think that's the analogy that applies to God. If because God, God would be more an elephant on this table rather than a cockroach someplace in this. God's a big life. guy. How yeah. could you miss him? Right. Well, I, I think that's right. But again, you may be putting God into your concept. Maybe the kind of God that you would see would need to be a God that that is so obvious in the world. And maybe that's not the way the world is designed to be. Well, we have to look at the concept of God to see when this argument applies and when it doesn't. So, for example, Zeus. Well, Zeus might hide up on Olympus. I don't know why Zeus bothers to come down anyway. So this argument might not apply to Zeus. Okay, But if, it, if we start talking about more traditional views of God, where God cares about us, and God could appear to someone who's about to commit a horrible crime of some sort, you know, a mugging or a murder or a rape or, or something, and could then stop that person from doing it, by making them realize what's going to happen to them if they do, then God could do a lot of good by appearing at the right time in the right way to the right people. And yet, God doesn't seem to do that. God seems to appear to believers when they're emotional in services, doesn't appear to the criminals that are about to hurt people. Uh, and so, uh, because there's not good evidence for those people that need to have God appear to them, that's a reason to think that at least a God of that good sort doesn't exist. I'll grant you it doesn't disprove Zeus, but it sure does cause a lot of problems for traditional views of God in the Judeo-Christian tradition. All right, I want, And other traditions. I want to conclude by asking you to go over each of your three arguments, and I want to number from 1 to 100 how confident you are that that proof <laughs> disproves the existence of God. 0 to 100. Problem from evil. I've got to, I've got to grade the argument. Yeah. Problem of evil, I'd say 98. Okay. Uh, a citation, as we say in Dartmouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second one, the, the argument from the, uh, the uh, uh, action of God, the contradiction between God being eternal and having to act in the world. Oh, I would say uh, 90, maybe 92, <laughs> uh, because there is a problem with agent you causation. Know, I didn't ask you might... to justify oh, okay. it. I just want a number. <laughs> I feel like I ought to justify it. <laughs> and uh, finally, the argument from ignorance that you, God is hidden. And I think there, it's a variable grade depending on which kind of God we're talking about. For some gods, 90, uh, even 95, uh, but for other gods, 80. <laughs>